picking the Saskatoons with the women, even just thinking about it now gives me goosebumps. It, there is something about gathering food, making food, sharing food for me that is really grounding and it's very joyful. It strengthens the connection when we can stand shoulder to shoulder and do that. Welcome back to the Return of the Buffalo podcast with Marcus Peter Rempel, your host. Um, glad to glad to be with you again after a bit of a break over the summer. Our guest today is a dear friend of mine, Rachel White Samard, uh, a blue-eyed Métis and uh, a fellow student in the Marriage and Family Therapy program at the University of Winnipeg, um, and. Uh, Someone who was a really important helper in the couples retreat and the and the women's retreat in 2019 at uh, Sandy Soto with the return of the Buffalo retreats, and uh, yeah, it was just great to have her back to uh, to share stories, uh, memories of of that time, and and also some of her own story as uh, as someone who can easily pass as white, but who has very significant uh, indigenous roots as part of her family story. Um, and, and just, just what, what walking in that kind of a pair of moccasins is like. So, um, yeah, really, really looking forward to share her insights and her story with, with you, our listeners. If you like what we're doing here, uh, I'd encourage you to please like us on, uh, whatever, whatever platform you're listening to us on, whether it's Apple podcasts or uh, Spotify, uh, or, or wherever you're connecting with us, um, that, that helps other folks find us um, who are who are interested in similar things. And uh, if you feel good about what we're doing here and you'd like to, to feed the fires at Sandy Soto, please think about making a donation. You can go to sandysoto.ca uh, and uh, one of the links you can press on there is a, is a donate button. Um, and uh, yeah, regular... Uh, one one time contributions are great. Uh, regular contributions really help us go the distance to uh, to keeping on with with the work that we're doing here. And now, without further ado, I give you my conversation with Rachel. <laughs> We're both we're both wearing toques. We are, we are. We yeah. could be like Bob, we could be like Bob and Doug McKenzie. Oh my God, that would be so good. That's one so of my favorite. How's that's it going, one of my eh? Favorite uh, programs going. Our on. our topic for today is <coughs> on the Great White North is <laughs> being blue eyed and Métis. So, <laughs> what do you got to say about it, eh? Exactly. Oh, it's good to see you. Yeah, uh, you too. And and hear you. So, I mean, you and I have become, you know, co-workers, friends. Uh, we've connected in a number of different ways. I was, I was trying to think back um, uh, in anticipation of this interview, like, how, how did that all start? And I, to, to me, the pivotal, I don't know how you might remember it. To me, there was a pivotal moment. You and I were both in our research methods class um and we were there was some discussion about um doing doing progress reports for clients um and and i remember and i remember you saying that you had made a commitment that you did your that you would write uh your progress reports not about your clients but with your clients um and and i remember thinking huh that is cool. Uh, I'd like to get to know this lady more. And uh, 
so that's that's kind of how I how I remember that it's uh, it's a treat to have you on. Me mm-hmm. being well impressed with you led to me uh, inviting you to join the staff of uh, the Return of the Buffalo retreats. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if we might just start there, just uh, uh, you know, a, a memory that you might share without you know betraying the confidence of anyone's personal story, but a memory you might share of of. Uh, your your time with Return of the Buffalo and uh, and maybe a hope for that project as mm-hmm. we're we're now really just on the cusp of of starting to have mm-hmm. on the land gatherings again so it's kind of an exciting time. Yeah, um, if I might go back actually, Marcus, and just sort of uh, offer um, as well sort of how we met. My story, of, I think, of how we you and I had met was um, because we we're in the same uh, program at the University of Winnipeg. Uh, it was at one of those uh, workshops. I think it was Dr. Bonnie Lee had come out from Lethbridge oh, yes. and was doing doing some work, and and I think I kept calling you Peter for some reason, oh. uh, which is which is kind of funny. And then um, and then actually it was through a connection through Mitch uh, Bourbonnier as well, where you had been invited to speak at one of our staff meetings. Um, okay. Yes. And I think it was something that, you know, how, how it is that you presented yourself um, uh, with great humility. That's one of the things I, I really appreciate about you. Um, and, and I just knew that, that we were probably supposed to work together or be friends or do something, do something together, meet and talk. So I remember approaching you afterwards and saying, I think we're supposed to know one another. Mm. And I don't know if you have people like that in your life where you just sort of meet yep. them and you just think this person is meant to be part of my journey. So mm. that's, that's who I remember who you were for me when I sort of firstly met you huh. and um, yeah. And then, you know, our, our, our paths just kind of kept crossing. Right. And so um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, Oh, for sure. To be part of the return of the Buffalo uh, retreats at Sandy Soto and to get to know, um, what's happening there? I guess what the what the creator wants for that land and for you know the people that walk on that land, what they what he wants or what they want for for that. So, mm. um, so that's my story. Yeah, uh, with her, yeah, it's good. It's good to to think back on those moments. I I have a terrible episodic memory, like of, of remembering things that happened and when I, I I'm much better, it seems at remembering ideas than things that happen. So mm. that's, that's nice to be remembered of those, those moments yeah. when our paths crossed. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And with regard to um, return of the Buffalo, your question was what, so what do I sort of remember about? Yeah. What's a memory you might share with, mm. with our listeners of uh, you know, what just an impression or a, Something that was yeah. meaningful to you about about how that that time went with with mm-hmm. the women uh, that you were b- sitting with, visiting with, connecting with on the land at at the, at the center, and uh, and yeah. then maybe a hope you might express. Sure. Um, so I was invited to to be part of um, to work as a helper uh, with Return of the Buffalo for the couples retreat, uh, and then also the women's retreat. So I've, I've had an experience with sort of both of those, um, which was lovely. And that's right, that's right. I, yeah, I think around the time that the women were gathering together, um, it was Saskatoon picking time. And so Saskatoon mm, picking is mm-hmm. part of my, um, my heritage. And um, it's something that my mom loved to do. And uh, she would often have, knowledge of where there was really good Saskatoon uh, bushes and she really she wouldn't share that information with really anybody she would just kind of get in the vehicle and off she would go and you know she would come home hours later with um, ice cream ice cream pails full of Saskatoons which um, she made pies with she usually made pies with them and my dad would my my dad would eat them with um, you know milk with like a little bit of sugar on top of them um, but she she saved them really for our family and uh, to make Saskatoon pies. So I think, you know, picking the Saskatoons with the women mm. um, that day just brought, I think, a whole 
like even just thinking about it now gives me goosebumps. It, there is something about gathering food, making food, sharing food for me that is really grounding and it's very joyful uh, for me. Um, and it doesn't usually really matter who I'm doing it with, you know, it's, but it is for surely, um, it strengthens the connection when we can stand shoulder to shoulder and, and do that. Um, and, and I think the other, um, the other memory that I have is when we were heading into the sweat lodge with the women and there was, and you're going to have to help me with some of the language here because I'm not really familiar with bird language but uh the fledg fledgling the hawk fledglings, yes. hawks were, yeah, yeah yeah fledgling so um so there was a mama hawk and they and she was uh you know she had baby hawks in her nest and it was time for them to start flying and to start learning how to use their wings and also then to you know she, part of part of her job as well is to teach them how to fend for themselves and feed themselves and but flying was the first the first task and it was so incredible how um that experience happened that I think it was like probably early afternoon when we went into the sweat and mm -hmm. uh there mm -hmm. was this crashing and um rustling in the bush really close by and I didn't I didn't really know what it was I probably would have you know, um, chalked it up to squirrels in the bush or something. Right. But you, you had shared that, you know, uh, that that's what it was. And, th and that made a lot of sort of the women, not a lot, but there was a few of the women who were heading into the sweat. We, we stood together and we sort of watched that experience. And, um, and isn't that what we do as, as parents and, and particularly as women, as mothers mm. is we, we um, spend so much of our, time and energy and and spirit to raise our children and then at some point we we um push them out of the nest you know to see can can you fly with those wings that I gave you um yeah so those are some really touching touching and those are the those are the experiences that I walk away from um from my time with Return of the Buffalo. My my hope would be, um, well, that we get to return to Return of the Buffalo mm -hmm. uh, to continue the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And man, like if, if I could have a hope for five or 10 years down the road is that we are able to bring this full circle so that the women and the couples and the men that that we have gotten to know get to actually get to be the helpers. They get yes. to take it over. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah. Yeah. You know, I bumped into I bumped into one of the women not from that retreat that year but from the year before um mm -hmm. at uh at the Orange Shirt Day gathering at St. John's Park in Winnipeg last week and Okay. Um, uh actually one of my my favorite one of my favorite kind of images of Return of the Buffalo is uh when she had her kids out for her, for the family day um she and all she's got five children just a lively bunch and they all mm. kind of there was this bean teepee in the garden the the trail of tears beans growing up this this kind of pole structure and and they all kind of piled the kids all sort of piled inside of the bean teepee and were poking their heads out of, you know among the green leaves in various places and she's kind of crouching down you know to get level with them um mm. and uh, it was this beautiful family photo that that we um that we couldn't post or share anywhere because even with her permission because her ch you know it wasn't a matter of her permission it was a matter of these children were wards of cfs and mm -hmm. so you couldn't you couldn't share images of these of these kids um and uh so it was a delight to, to see them and and hear that just very recently um she closed the last of of the files that she had with with cfs and her kids are now you know, okay. permanently uh, back back with her, and um, mm -hmm. and she actually said to me that you know she's going to school for you know becoming a family support worker now. Wonderful. So Great. so that that vision and that hope is already kind of underway. It seems. Great. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, and thanks for sharing this, the memories of the berries and the hawks. I remember when we were berry picking, I remember one of the women just saying, oh, this is so therapeutic. <laughs> uh, and I just, like, when she said that, I was like, yeah, that's the whole, like, that's the whole return of the buffalo thing yeah. right there yeah. is, is that there's something deeply healing about uh, the memories and the connections and the, you know, also mm. the metaphors of touching creation, you know, like that, that, yeah. that those fledgling hawks and, and all the teachings that are, that are mm -hmm. just there for us that we, I mean, there's wonderful things as you and I both know, there's amazing things that can happen in, in a room with a, uh, a skilled helper who sits with us and helps us, you know, unpack our stories mm -hmm. and, and, and come into a new re relationship with, with our past and with, you know, the people in our life. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, we don't have creation as a kind of co-therapist, co-healer in the room with us in the same way. Like there's just these surprises that happen, right? When you mm -hmm. move on the land, mm -hmm. you're, you're just, you're moving into a space of surprise where if you just keep your eyes open and your, and your other senses open, the creator will send you messengers, um, mm -hmm. that, that have a harder time breaking through to the, you know, our, our closed offices and our, our couches. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think some of, some of what is missing though, uh, you know, if, if we think about the opportunities that the land and, and mother earth can sort of offer us is, is the sort of mediator, the translator, you know, mm. uh, not the mediator. I think the translator is probably a better word, a navigator perhaps even, um, because there are uh, uh, beautiful lessons every day for us, um, you know, offered to us. But because we've become so um, detached and disconnected and we've been forbidden to know yes. Yes. how does that how does that impact me as a human, uh, you know, walking on this earth? How how do I understand that? Um, and we've only been given you know one narrative about yeah about the land i mean i think it's starting to shift that's that's wonderful yeah. but you know i lived on the land um like i lived uh, lived on the land i you know i grew up uh in a in a small community in a small farming community in in southwestern manitoba and you know my parents uh, had a big garden that, so that was a really big part of what we did my parents hunted or my, my dad hunted for the longest time as he got older he 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 didn't do that so you know having venison and um and gross gross I think it is there some sort of bird that you know uh, my dad would my dad would come home with or my uncles would come over with um and you know Saskatoon's and canning and all of that sort of stuff, making bannock, you know, uh, making bread, making cookies. My, I would come home from school and my mom's table would be full of, of delights for us. Um, but the piece that was missing, I think, was, yes, we get to eat and consume and reap that, but why is it there to begin with? And yeah. how do I honor it? And how do I yeah. not just give in to my vices and, and just... Uh, eat it, eat it all and not share it. Um, and I think, um, yeah, so I think w one of the things that is missing uh, are the stories of how do we honor what's been offered to us by consuming it and in, in a way that is um, honoring Mother Earth, but how do we also share it and how do we not take too much of it? Uh, I think those yeah. are the pieces yeah. that are have have fallen away from how it is that we're we're living. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's really a a very important point about we need those translators, as you say, those mm -hmm. interpreters. Um, mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I, I mean the the Christian tradition, uh, which has been you know, hugely influential for for good and for bad for both you and me. Um, mm -hmm. generally, uh, you know, has been a kind of, I don't know, flat is maybe a word I, I think of in terms of how it interprets mm -hmm. and translates, you know, all the, 
-hmm. the complexity and the interrelatedness of the, the voices that come to us through creation. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's been, a, I think, a, a history of feeling uh, out of out of loyalty to the creator. There's a sense that we have to, like, silence the rest of the choir. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Which, you know, pretty twisted. But anyway, I, yeah. I think, I, I mean, I think be, because I, I've, I've often thought, you know, because those those experiences, those direct experiences in creation can be so powerful, I think, in many ways, the people mm -hmm. who have been in charge of mediating uh, connection with the divine in the Christian tradition have often felt like, you know, if church is kind of boring and uh, things are pretty interesting, if you just start looking out the windows, like, we go, <laughs> we don't want, we got to keep the people in the box because right, they might, right. they might not, uh, they might get bored with us and not, not keep coming around. And so all kinds mm -hmm. of, you know, emotional blackmail and fear and, Hellfire threats have been uh, summoned to keep people inside the the safe, you know, mm -hmm. under the skirts of Mother Church. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I want to uh, I want to ask you about um, this. I think this is a memory. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned the 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 workshop that we both had with, with Dr. Bonnie Lee, I think it was there. I remember, I think I remember you saying something when you introduced yourself about being a blue eyed Métis uh, mm. at that, at that gathering. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the, there's, there's a like, there's a lot in that in there. So let's just, let's just yeah. start about, let's talk about the Métis mm -hmm. part and then maybe we'll talk about the blue eyed uh, part. Sure. What is what what does being Métis mean to you, Rachel? Oh, um, I mean, I I didn't know that I was that I was Métis or that my mom was Métis uh, when I was younger. Uh, so my parents had me and my my older sister. I'm the youngest of of six children, born to my mom and and. Uh, I was raised with my three older sisters, um, and that that was a story uh, that wasn't told to us when I, when we were growing up. Um, mm. And so, f I, and I have been trying to actually figure out like how did how did I find out that I was made to eat, you know like how did mm. I know to start digging? And one of the things about me that really probably irritated my parents particularly my mom was that I was a I was such a curious child uh, I was a curious George and I was often you know in our big house looking through you know dresser drawers and uh, corners of the houses and into boxes and just wondering like what is there to discover and my mom really didn't want me to discover certain things about about uh, her life and um, they were important for her she had made a choice to to turn in a different direction, uh, which are, which is part of her story. And, and, um, I understand why, why she did that. And so, you know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, my, my husband, uh, who I met when I was 18 actually comes from the same community as my mom. And so, because I think I would go back to that community, uh, because I was visiting my in-laws and we would visit lots. And then I would also, see uh sometimes see my uncle who is my mom's my mom's um brother and also some other relatives that were there on my mom's side but then i there must have been something that started happening for me where i realized that there must we must have metis heritage uh because the community uh that my mom and my husband come from uh, there's a very um healthy population of Métis people there. And so I, at the time, went to um, the Centre de Patrimoine, which is like a genealog the genealogy center or whatever for Métis people in Winnipeg and, you know, started doing some digging and it didn't actually take very long to find, to find, that, to find that linkage to my Métis heritage. And when I told my mom that I was doing that, 
she wasn't really too pleased and she didn't really understand why I would do that. Um, but then when I did, when I did find confirmation of it, land script and this whole genealogy that offered information to me and my, and my family that, you know, we had, you know, ancestors all the way back to the 16th century that came from, you know, long time in Quebec and then, and then into France. But, uh, that for me, uh, that was that probably happened about 15 years ago, I would say. And that for me was the beginning of understanding, like, what what does Métis mean? What does being a Métis person mean in Manitoba? And I would say that that's been gaining, that's been gaining speed and gaining depth uh, over the past probably 10 years. And... Um, So for me, it's actually been a key, um, you know, it's one of these big keys and I'm trying to think of like a movie like National Treasure or something where they find this sort of like steel or metal piece that looks, it has this configuration that looks really weird and you know that it fits into something and it will unlock a treasure or it unlocks uh, something knowledge or a gift or special powers or something like that right so I I knew that that was sort of that major key but I didn't really know what it was going to unlock and then when I when I got that key and I started to you know put it in its place and started to gradually sort of turn it and to see like how would this fit in and then they what I realized is that there was so much of being Métis that my mom actually brought into raising us and into mm. our home that I didn't actually know was Métis. Um, so that's how I understand it. Um, it's ground that I, I tentatively walk on. Um, I, and I move into it. I move into it sometimes and then I move out of it. Um, and so for me, the um, being Métis is about finding finding my ancestors and understanding why why I was raised the way I was raised uh, and the gifts that come with it, but also the hardships. Why were there Why were there so many hardships? Um, and then also being in, you know, a part of that's really accelerated that process for me that I've been able to have the opportunity to to dig into is is being at the University of Winnipeg in the marriage and family therapy program. Um, you know, so mm. much of that program is about looking back into our family of origin, understanding ourselves as, you know, people who are going to be out out in the community as helpers, as therapists. Um and also the uh, systems approach to the program as well has also helped me understand. It's helped me depathologize my mom uh, and my family to understand the systems in which caused there's to be so many, so little choices for uh, my parents at the time mm -hmm. to be able to live the life that they, that they lived. Um, I mean, we could do a whole podcast on family of origin for me, but just because it, it, it is so, um, it's so complex and dynamic. Uh, but for me, piecing all of those pieces together has really helped me get to the point where I can introduce myself saying that I'm a blue-eyed Métis woman. Uh, I think mm. before I would have felt um, shy to do it. Not that I ever feel embarrassed at all, not at all. It's, it's more about like, do I have the right to say that? Do I have the right to say right. that I'm a Métis person? And the more I get to know the Métis community now and also uh, the circumstances in which, you know, my mom, my mom grew up and my aunties and my uncles and my, you know, my grandparents, uh, the more I know that story, the more for me, it gives me permission to be able to say that, you know, I'm a Métis right. woman. Yeah. I mean, the, the, so the blue eyed, the blue eyed piece, sorry, go ahead, Marcus. Well, I, I, you've really brought that part of the story that was in the shadows out of the shadows 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and so it it I, I imagine that strengthened your relationship to that considerably, and I uh, mm-hmm. that that sense of confidence in claiming that. I before we start talking about the blue eyed bit, like what would be what would be one either you know way of being in the world or, or habit or or, or food mm-hmm. or, or 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 you know way of praying or something even that you would have picked mm-hmm. up from your mom that in hindsight you realized, mm-hmm. oh, this was her bringing uh, our Métis heritage into mm-hmm. our family with, without even naming it as such. Mm-hmm. Um, I think her sense of generosity. Mm. Yeah, uh, particularly around food. Um, so Thanksgiving, you know, we're, we're coming up onto Thanksgiving weekend. Thanksgiving weekend is actually a really important weekend for me. Uh, it, it was always a celebration, uh, for my fam, for my parents, you know, my parents have both passed. My mom, my mom died 10 years ago and my dad followed 50 weeks later and died nine years, like has died, has now gone for, it's now gone for nine years. And, um, but it's me, it's been a really important, I think guidepost for uh, our family. So we, all of us girls uh, from my mom and from my mom and dad's family, we always went home with our children. Um, and my mom would have, you know, been preparing food for quite some time and all the preserves were ready. Um, mm. You know, we would have a selection of desserts. We would have turkey and ham. Um, we would have fresh buns. We would have homemade cabbage rolls and homemade pierogies. And there would probably be aunties and uncles who, you know, we would maybe only see once a year. There was an opportunity to actually see them there. And, um, and so for me, you know, I was really lucky to um, be able to witness, you know, my parents becoming grandparents with my children. And Mm -hmm. The memories of my that my children have is that Thanksgiving is really important. So there's something in in them that is um, that this weekend is really important for them, and so we will this weekend get together, and uh, part of that will probably be reminiscing about you know my my parents, and we'll phone. I'll probably phone my sisters, a couple of my sisters, and we'll talk probably while I'm in the kitchen, you know, doing doing something, and. Um, and, and we, um, you know, outside of COVID times, we would have opened our table to other people to come, you know, right. to, to share food with us. Um, so her sense of generosity, like I, I think she did lots of things. She gave food away all the time. You know, if you came over and you just like came over to just drop something off or whatever, she, you were probably going home with like a small jar of like fresh raspberry jam which my dad would have hated because, you know, that's, that's for him. But he, <laughs> she, she was like, she was sending it home. Um, or if she was, if you were lucky and it was cinnamon bun making day, you went home with, you know, some cinnamon buns. Um, yeah. And whenever we came home, like, you know, early on in our marriage, uh, um, you know, Jared and I didn't have a lot and my parents always filled our freezer. They, they brought all sorts of stuff from their pantry shelf. Um, and she would give food away to people in the community, you know, who didn't have a turkey and didn't have potatoes and stuff, uh, you mm. know, like she would just make sure that that would happen. And lots of those things she never talked about until actually later on in her life. Um, so she did all these, a lot of these things sort of in secret. My uncle, who had a really difficult relationship with alcohol, um, didn't have a lot of money. Him and his, him and his wife both, both had a really... Um, difficult relationship with alcohol and so you know my parents when they would go home they would bring food uh you know for my aunt and uncle and drop it off and so for me that's a piece that is sort of one of the cornerstones I think of being Métis for me um and I know that that's part of other people's cultures and other people's way of living but for me that's where it sits inside of inside of my spirit it's that's a really big part of of being Métis mm-hmm. and the gifts that my mom, my mom gave, gave us. Yeah. I think of the, the instinct and the energy that you had to organize gifts uh, and food for mm-hmm. our return of the Buffalo families at Christmas. 
last year. And right. uh, yeah, I can see I can see a mm -hmm. kind of a direct line of descent there uh, from, from yeah. your mom. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I think the people like the people that, you know, I gathered to to my circle, uh, you know, who are really good friends of mine and who I would call, you know, my family. Um, they they have a really strong uh, sense of generosity and sharing is important to them and opening their table, opening their home to people who aren't biologically, they're not biologically related to, but that they, um, for some reason are part of their life. And my mom demonstrated that. So, yeah. Yeah. I, that, I think that's really significant too, that the, the generosity is, is a, it's about bringing the family together, but yeah. it's also about this enlarged sense of all my relations in a sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right? That, that sense of behaving as a as a caring relative beyond the beyond the tribe also yeah um, yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um so we've mentioned your blue eyes uh you you're someone who could mm -hmm. easily just pass as as white um yeah and yeah I just want to ask you, what's, what's your relationship with whiteness like, Rachel? Mm. Well, interesting, because white is actually my, my maiden That's... name as well, the name that I right. was born with, you know, so, um, yeah, I, th I think as I've sort of started moving into understanding, you know, my Métis heritage, um, you know, I've re I realized, like, the Métis Nation is made up of many different people. There is a, 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 an incredible diversity in in our um, in our community, but we we do have some roots that you know kind of consider us to be Métis, right? And um, you know, for me, my mom my mom partnered up with somebody who is uh, Scottish English, and so uh, I I got I got sort of that coloring you know I got a very very pale skin and blue eyes and I used to have brown hair but now I have like stark white hair um and I think one of the things that I'm coming um I'm, I'm resolving about being Métis is that you know one of the one of the narratives within the Métis community from what I understand from my own learning is that um we are we are a nation or a people that we have we have two significant sort of sides an, an indigenous side and also a European colonial side to us and that for me I'm I'm at a point recently I think understanding how that is really um, how I hold those two things how do, how do I hold those two things as separate but my work recently has been more about like how do I weave those two those two beautiful uh, cultures and heritages and gifts together. Um, so, you know, one of the things about being white and blue eyed is that, you know, it, it can make me quite actually invisible. Yeah. Uh, it can make me look like was, so many other people. That. Yeah. And I think as I grew up, um, it, it, it did that. Uh, and as I've now, you know, learning more and expanding, expanding who it is that I am and figuring out my identity and also choosing my identity, you know, how it is. Like I could have easily have said, you know, at that meeting, I'm a blue eyed Scott English woman, right. you know, but I, but I am choosing in that moment, I chose to say I'm a blue eyed Métis woman. Um, and so there, there is a part of me as well that still is quite vocal um, that creates some friction inside of me that says like, do I have a right to be able to be in indigenous circles? Um, mm. And so I walk, I walk tentatively when I'm, when I'm am in circles with other indigenous people Um and I have to remind myself that I have a right to some of 
to some of what is being um, spoken about, like with the residential schools and the Every Child Matters. You know, my my, my mom has a history, uh, like living and growing up in a residential school. That's so that's mm. part of my my mom's history, which I inherited it as well. And so sometimes it's well, do I, I'm this like white blue eyed woman who is pretty middle class, and um, do I have a right to be able to? receive funds from the MMF for education? And uh, do I have a right to um, walk in the rallies and, 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 you know, use my voice? And so I'm, I don't think that'll ever change for me, Marcus. I think that's going to be something that I'm always going to be uh, really aware of and walk yeah. tenderly. And I don't, I don't mind. I don't mind doing that. Hmm. Um, yeah. I'm reminded that just this morning, a, a mentor of mine, this was about a, another tension, but uh, mm. he, uh, he left me with these words that there are, there are tensions that just have to be faced and lived and never resolved. Uh, and I, I feel like I hear that in your story. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your, your work with action therapy. Action therapy was uh, really sure. a, a really important connection for return of the Buffalo in terms of recruiting staff. Quite a few mm -hmm. of, of our key people came to us through that network uh, mm -hmm. recommended by, by Mitch Bourbonier, who you've, you've mentioned already. And um, mm -hmm. we had him on uh, Henry and I had him on, uh, a mm -hmm. while back talking about his, his philosophy of, of lateral empathy, um, yeah. which, which I, I really love. Um, and, and that kind of uncle auntie approach, uh, that, mm -hmm. that he articulates and lives, uh, in, in, in his work and his network that, that connects with CFS involved young people. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so you, you got involved and you continue to do similar work. And I, I just, you know, if you could just describe your work for us um, sure. and, and maybe even talk about that, like walking that line between auntie figure uh, <laughs> and tr trauma informed clinician. Uh, I, I think that would be, yeah. you know, that'd be really relevant to the kind of work that we do at return of the Buffalo and, and try to think about together and, and, and spread mm -hmm. Yeah, I had I had the opportunity to meet Mitch when I was doing a um, uh, when I was kind of setting the groundwork to go into my master's in marriage and family therapy and and so I was at the University of Manitoba and I was uh, I took the applied counseling certificate program there and that's where I met him and finished that finished you know that certificate and realized that you know um, going on to do additional work in a master's program was was where I was headed and. Um, you know, the one thing that, you know, Mitch reminds, uh, reminds us of if you're in his presence is that you have wings kind of go kind of a little bit going back to the hawk story. Oh, interesting. You yeah. have wings and yet you've been in my nest, but now it's time to go and fly, uh, mm. and, and create your own nest and then do the same thing over and over again. I mean, I think that is, um, mm. one of the hallmarks of, uh, a great leader is to know that, right. Yeah. is to, to help, to help, um, encourage and support and create more leaders in the world. Yeah. And, you know, in and one of the last gift, classes, he has, a, he has a real gift for that. Doesn't he, he's, 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 he's not, does. he's, he's not making a cult yeah. of personality where it's like, mm -mm. no, it's, it's always kind of this sort of super abundant throwing yeah. attention and light and encouragement towards others. And, yeah. and, and seeing their yeah. seeing their greatness rather than yeah. somehow trying to draw attention to his own greatness. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, yeah it's a different sort of generosity, right? Uh, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, and so I started doing work in the southeast, uh, which is where which is where I live, um, as an action therapist, and um, you know received some referrals from him out you know, to work with kids, uh, yeah, who have uh, child and family involvement. 
And, um, and a lot of those kids are youth at risk who, who have been really hurt along the way of being a child and a young person and who uh, rightfully have a lot of protections, protection mechanisms built in Mm -hmm. um, knowing that people aren't going to hang around that, you know, you're going to let me down. um, You don't understand me, those sorts of messages. And, um, and so that relationship and connection is really, I think one of the, the cornerstones of the work of an action therapist is, is to model a healthy adult child, adult youth relationship, which can, can then become a corrective healing experience for them. Very hard to write in a report (laughs) for, you know, the child and family services agency that's contracting you to do that sort of work, right? It it is something like those, Mm. um, invisible building blocks that help us just become the people that we are. You know, we all have those if we all think back into the relationships and the attachments that we have right. with perhaps school teachers or a soccer coach or a music teacher or, um, you know, an uncle or an auntie. Yeah. Someone who was there for me. Yeah. Someone who was there for me. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I've done, I've done lots of that work. Uh, and And then as I've sort of traveled through my studies, I have started to sort of move into an area of doing sort of more of a Western colonial therapy practice. And so I, again, I'm, I hold two things. This is my story. I hold two things in my hands and I am trying to figure out how do I weave those two together? How can I create a space in my life? And in my work to be able to continue to do that work, because I think it is so important. It's very important work because a lot of those, a lot of those kids and youth and families don't fit into a Western colonial therapy box. Yeah. And, and so we, you know, so part of the practice that I do is, is I do some of that. I do some of that work, action therapy work where, you know, I'm out kind of um, building connection with, with kids and giving them a safe place to be able to talk about, you know, what's going on in their life and how their heart has been hurt and their spirit has been hurt. And, and a lot of the time it takes a long time for that because, you know, they've been, they've been hurt over and over and over again. And so often, you know, sometimes I would find myself, you know, or we're a year into um, a relationship where we might be seeing each other weekly, you know, for a couple hours a week. Uh, And, and then a year later, um, you know, a big chunk of their story comes out. Um, Yeah. 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 And, and rightly so. Um, Why would they trust me? Right. And so I have to prove myself to them that, that I am somebody who's going to be there for them, who's going to listen, who's not going to judge, who's going to, who's going to pick them up every week, you know, when I say I'm going to, and that, that model works for, um, for a population of kids that Western colonial sort of traditional therapy doesn't. That's, that's my belief. Um, and yet, you know, so much of our world is about working and living inside this, the, the colonial structure that is part of our life. And so um, I try and do both. That's, and, and I try and find ways to be able to, like, like you know, you said, uh, you know, you heard me speak about the research methods class that we were in and how I, you know, brought, you know, brought, um, you know, to say like, yeah, we, we do, we can work inside of a structure that is, is colonial, and, but we can also bring in a voice that says this doesn't work and this is how I'm going to do it. Uh, and it's not about sneaking it in by the side door. It's about being really open and transparent and having a conversation about why this is important to do it this way. Um, and that, that idea wasn't mine. You know, I, mm. that idea was, um, you know, something that, uh, you know, I'd, I, I had, um, uh, you know, a friend of mine, Kelly, who, who also worked at Return of the Buffalo had shared with me, you know, and 
I, I use that. I, uh, I felt really, I feel really honored to, to know Kelly and um, I trust her and she's a wise woman. And so I, I use that method and um, yeah. So, you know, I think part of the work that attracts me to, you know, um, being an auntie or trying to be somebody's auntie, right? Like trying to be somebody's person, adult person in the world is that I didn't have that for myself when I was growing up. Uh, and I sure in the heck know that my mom didn't have it. Um, and so part of that is an intergenerational healing as well. So we talk a lot about intergenerational trauma. But for me, uh, as a way to continue to heal, you know, the relationship that I had with this difficult relationship that I sometimes had with my mother uh, and the structures that brought you know, my mom to the place that she was, um, and the choices, this, the few choices that she had is me doing generous, uh, relationship work in the present, either within my, with my family, with my friends, but also in my work that for me is healing me, but it is also healing for mm. me. I see it as just healing intergenerationally sort of backwards. So it's, for me, it's healing my ancestors as well. And mm. also, you know, my, 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 my grandfather, who is my mom's, my great grandfather, who is my mom's grandfather, you know, he lived, um, he was a Métis man, but he knew five languages. He knew Cree, Sioux, Machif, English, and French. And mm. he lived with my grandma, uh, my great grandma, you know, on a, on a piece of land in the Fort Ellis area for a very long time and gathered and hunted and, and did all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, I, I guess maybe I do that work to honor him and to honor them. I do this work now to honor them. I don't mm. know them. I, I only yeah, know their yeah, story. Yeah. I only know their stories. But for me, that's, that's really import, important. Yeah. Mm. You've shared a number of times that image of weaving. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to think of the Métis sash. Mm -hmm. and and as the as the metis people really as these these fundamental weavers uh of of bringing in bringing together um mm -hmm. two cultures that really um had a hard time coming together in a good way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and uh and it yeah i think i think yeah, there's a very special gift and uh, kind of a history of that weaving work uh, that Métis mm -hmm. people bring to the the conversation of of truth and reconciliation. You know, because you mm -hmm. you really carry inside your your bones and your arteries and your genes this mm -hmm. this these these stories uh, and these these weavings uh, that mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, to, to to cut off one or the other would be a real amputation. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if you if you think, if we if, if we kind of continue down that analogy, Marcus, you know, and we think about, you know, when there there is some uh, a piece of fabric that's woven, and if we decide to um, cut out a piece of of that, you know, so if I think about cutting out my my dad's Scottish and English side of of who it is that I am, I mean, it creates a hole, right? Yep. There's, yep. it weakens, it also weakens the, the end product, right? Um, and so part of my discovery is I've spent a long, I spent, I've spent a long time um, trying to figure out my, my mom's past and to, to be able to understand my relationship with her and to heal and to heal parts of myself from that. Uh, and part of that has, um, Part of that has been understanding the sort of structures and the the time of the the 20th century that she she lived in um, that had a huge influence on on her and as as it did on all like all women who who were part of the the 20th century and the um, 
now I think, you know, some of the work that I'm doing is I'm actually delving into my dad's side. And so I'm, I'm trying to understand the Scottish and the English part because they did, they came together and they raised a family, you know, they raised all of us, they created us. And so I am as much part of my mother as I am as, of my father. And, um, and so it's important for me as well to understand those strands, those strands and how, how it has created um, the fabric of our family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it occurs to me to ask you about your spirit name, Rachel. In the context of the conversation about um, your, your reconnecting and reclaiming with, with your identity, um, because your your spirit name, uh, there is there is, uh, I'll, I'll let you name your name, but there mm-hmm. there's this there's this part of your name that speaks to kind of emergence, uh, mm. um, so uh, and and I I I was there for the I happened to be there in the ceremony where you received your name. Mm-hmm. Um, you and I actually both received spirit names from elders who were c- connected to Return of the Buffalo. Okay. Um, so, um, so maybe just tell that story and, and, uh, you know, what that, what that, I mean, the meaning of that name for you, I'm sure will, will mean something new, uh, you know, at any different point, it'll, it'll mean something new at any point in your life, but mm-hmm. well, you know, what, what's it, what's it mean to you, uh, these days as you're, as you're walking with that name? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was, um, honored to receive my my name in my first sweat actually and by the one of the knowledge keepers who who walked with some of us um and some of the families uh at the return of the buffalo retreat and uh so my name is turtle woman coming out and um my understanding of of spirit names is that they reside they reside within you and it's not something that is created externally outside of you it's actually something that's seen by an elder uh seen by a knowledge it's recognized keeper and is revealed to you so it's always been yeah. there in you um so you know like it, it, if i were to paint a picture of how meaningful you know receiving my spirit name is like that would be that would sort of be the sky of my painting would be that like laying that sort of foundation is that that it actually was part of me um, even before, you know, before mm. I met anybody at Return of the Buffalo and it were, and it really, uh, uh, it was, it was revealed to, uh, Sheldon when we were in the sweat. And one of the other things that was really, um, is really meaningful for me is that I chose not to ask anything of, uh, the elder at that sweat mm. because, for me, I was, I was felt, I really felt like I was at the beginning of learning about, um, you know, being indigenous, um, that part of me. And I was also, I also just didn't want to take up a lot of space. I wanted there to be as much space for the people who were attending the family and the women and the men who were attending. And I didn't want to take up, um, anything. And so I didn't offer tobacco to, to Sheldon and ask for that. I went in and um, in one of the rounds uh, we were asked to, you know, just to talk if we wanted to. And um, there had been a a point in a, in a trip that I had taken to Mexico where I actually saw um, turtles um, coming out of their shells. And if you know anything about turtles, what, what the mama turtles do is they dig this hole in the sand in a fairly safe place and they lay their eggs and then they cover them all of these eggs up these beautiful little white eggs and they and they cover them back up with the sand and then they 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 go off they go back to the ocean that's my understanding of what turtles do and uh we were there one day um when actually the baby turtles were actually hatching and they were, and we were just walking on the beach. It was just really haphazard. We were walking on the beach and then we kind of, we came across something that was something that was coming out of the sand. 
and and it was an area that was protected that they were actually doing some work to um to protect uh turtles and so this area was mm. sort of closed off so we mm. knew that there was an area there where there was a lot of um turtle eggs and you just never think that you're actually going to be in one of those moments where you're going to see that and and that's that's the gift that was offered to me that morning was i was actually walking with my my oldest sister and we were um uh, we, we came across uh, this rustling underneath the sand and a baby turtle kind of came out. And the thing with that is that it's usually when, you know, one baby turtle comes out, like the rest of them are, are ready to hatch and they all sort of hatch at the same time. And so not only did we get to witness seeing, you know, one baby turtle sort of come out of the, out of the sand, out of its shell, but we saw like numerous, I think there was probably like about 12 or 16 of them all sort of kind of mm. came out of the sand mm. with their little, with their little flippers, I guess that's what they have and make their way up onto the top of the sand. And when I was in the sweat that day, uh, that's what sort of came to my mind. And I was talking about that. And then, um, and talking a little bit about, um, I wasn't talking specifically about my journey, but metaphorically, I was talking about the journey of being somewhere uh, and then feeling like you're hatching or you're, or you're, you're strong enough and brave enough to kind of sh start showing the world who it is that you are. And so that would have been that process of sort of coming out of the sand and then realizing that, you know, you still have a long journey. You still have to trek across mm. the sand, this really, really hot sand, not get picked off by seagulls and other sorts of birds that are just waiting to, um, to have lunch, you know, and, and also um, thinking about like, trekking across the sand and, and being squished by, you know, tourists, you know, who are just like walking along and not even like realizing what it is that they're doing and stepping on you and then making your way actually into the water. And even then you're not really safe. You're, you're, you still have to be courageous and brave and, oh yeah and instinctual about where it is that you're heading and, and, and believe that the, you know, the force that helped you sort of come out of the sand is also with you as you travel across the sand as well as it is when you're in the water. And, um, so I, I had, I had spoken to that. I didn't speak about any, anything about my journey at all as a woman, um, and a Métis person, but, um, and then someone else shared and then Sheldon, who was our knowledge keeper at the time actually, you know, stopped and actually, uh, said that he wanted to, he wanted to give us our, he wanted to reveal our spirit names. And, uh, and so it was just really um, meaningful because I had intentionally not wanted, hadn't, hadn't asked, mm -hmm. hadn't asked for a name and he, yet he gave it to me. And so there's extra meaning there for me. And, mm -hmm. um, and then after the ceremony as well, he also presented me with a, with a turtle shell, uh, which he's, which he's asked for me to make a rattle out of and, and I have yet to, I have yet to do that so um and then just along the mm. way you know it's been um turtles have just kind of come to cut have just come to me I sometimes I'm driving and I see a turtle trying to cross the road and I stop my vehicle and I pick it up and I move it over mm. onto the ditch because mm. I can't even think about the idea that it would get driven over mm. or mm. uh you know going going kayaking down, you know, the Broken Head River, you know, and seeing all of these painted turtles just basking in the sun and hibernating or, or not hibernating, but um, just enjoying themselves alongside the riverbanks. And um, yeah, so, so that's the story behind how I received my name. Um, and it, it it's, not a story that I tell a lot of people. Um, it's it's a pretty meaningful and intimate story for me to share, and you have to um, you have to mean a lot to me to for me to share that with you. So <laughs> I don't know mm. if that makes sense, but I think that's how just precious how precious that experience yeah. and how precious that yeah. name is for me. Um, and some people don't get it, and and I'm. Yeah. And it's not something that I brag about or it's not something that I it's important for me to share. So it's it's um yeah. 
Mm. I think that's wise. I, you know, I remember someone I really respect. I, I had a, a very significant experience one time mm -hmm. on a spiritual retreat. Mm. Um, and it was, was starting to talk to some people about it and, and who I respected and, uh, and one of those people fairly early on in that process said to me, don't talk to too many people about this. Mm. Um, and, and at the time I was just sort of overflowing with excitement, but, it, mm -hmm. uh, as, as time passed, I really saw the wisdom of that, that there's a way in which mm -hmm. something like that can get cheapened or, yeah. or, or the, and also I think what ha what happens is it, it's like it, the, your connection to the story becomes or to that experience after a while, you're just connecting to the sound of your own voice, mm -hmm. retelling the story. Yeah. And, and you, and you actually become less connected to the experience that you had. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, um, yeah, I'm really honored. Yeah. You, and you know, it you actually reminds me as, as you're talking us. about that, Marcus, it reminds me a little bit about, I, you know, I used to do some doula work and, uh, for those of you who don't know what a doula is, is, you know, it's it's uh, somebody who walks alongside a pregnant woman as she's preparing to sort of give birth and provides actually like mm -hmm, emotional mm -hmm. and physical support. So it's not at all like a midwife uh, where the midwives, they do all of that. Plus they do all the medical piece to it as well. But doulas are sort of like the women who stand with the 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 soon to be mother as they walk through this process and of of, um, you know, birthing, birthing new life and. I remember hearing in, in midwifery and doula circles that, um, you know, stories of birth, uh, because they're so precious, um, and they're such an intimate experience that they only, mm -hmm. usually they only need to be shared with people that you really trust. And you're actually giving somebody a gift when you are offering that story to them of, of bringing life into the world. And so I, I think I, there is, for me, that is woven together with my story of receiving my spirit name is that, is that mm -hmm. um, I'm actually giving you something by telling you this story and you actually have to be in a place where you can hold that. And it's an honor. Right. It's an honor uh, to, to receive that teaching or that story. And uh, the same thing for me, you know, when I'm sitting in circles and, and, you know, elders or other people are, are sharing their stories or sharing parts of their lives. Like I feel very honored to be in that circle yeah. Um, yeah. because they are sharing a part of their heart or their spirit with me. And that's, um, I want to hold that with, with honor. Mm. Yeah. That's a beautiful teaching and, and, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe especially apt for someone who carries a name that really speaks of birthing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering about while you were talking about uh, how you've set up your practice and how even your practice has this mm -hmm. kind of like foot in two worlds, mm -hmm. um, and and you you used the the, the kind of the adjectives of like sort of Western colonial tra sort of traditional to describe, mm -hmm. um, you know, one side of your practice. I, I'm like, like those are pretty loaded words. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, and I wonder about like, besides, besides the reason of the, that, that kind of that approach is where the power and the money is. Mm -hmm. um, are, are there other reasons like like are there are, are there other things in that in that tr tradition that that are important to you that that feel like uh you know apart from any kind of power uh privilege are you know are, are worth holding on to just because they you know they, they work well for certain certain things hmm. you mean in the western colonial sort of structure yeah yeah of how like, to, like, tradi of doing traditional, like a traditional western psychotherapeutic you know what, mm -hmm. whatever uh whatever we call that way of doing healing work yeah uh i mean i i 
I think back on, um, oh gosh, I want, I'm going to say this on a, like a, 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 um, a post on Instagram. Sorry. You know, I, <laughs> with, with the blow up of like hey. Facebook and Instagram recently, I'm just like, I don't want to, do I actually want to let people know that I, I use those platforms, but I do. So, uh, and, and there's, you you're, know, some, you're not alone. <laughs> there's some good stuff that actually comes out of it. But, um, one of the things that I'd come across of one time was, you know, uh, how do we make change in the world? And, and, you know, I would love to, um, you know, I'd love to drive a vehicle that doesn't rape the, you know, the, the sort of mm. the gas and the oil uh, from underneath the land and create disaster, you know, but the thing is, is that I, yeah. I can't, I, but I could, I could do work. Uh, but I would need my vehicle to get to work. And so, you know, people who work in, in the environmental um, industry, or if, you know, they're, they want to be a change maker, they still need to use part of our present day resources to be able to still do that sort of work. Right. Does that make sense? Mm. Did I, 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 yeah, I, th I think, it, tell me if I'm hearing this right. Like the, mm. there, there's a sense that um, th there's there's a certain tension that you're you're having that you've just had to learn to live with that there there are mm -hmm. these these very let's say powerful tools you know whether it's a car or also mm -hmm. you know I'm guessing the, the car is a metaphor for other things in you know in your in your clinical practice even mm -hmm. you know there's these powerful tools that can mm -hmm. uh, that can get us somewhere. Um, yeah. And, you know, I guess, you know, another sort of uh, story would be, you know, talking with a, a, a fellow action therapist and, and he was saying that he got, he got called out by a youth one time saying, you know, you're only like spending time with me because you get paid. Ah, uh, yes. And, he, you know, this youth called out the sort of the cap, the capitalist colonial structure yeah. that their relationship was being held in. And yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the action therapist, you know, wisely uh, fielded, fielded that comment by saying, yes, you're right. You know, but the thing is, is that I, it is the capitalist system, but that's the only way that I can be in relationship with you. And I want to be in relationship with you. So I have to use this method right now to be able to do the work and to push the edges of the work that, you know, I, I'm doing. And so I get, I guess for me, you know, when you, when I go back, so, so when I think about like your initial question is, I think I came into wanting to be a counselor and a therapist with a really narrow view of what I could be doing. What would I, what would I be doing? And as yeah. I've traveled this road for the past 10 years now, it has really, really grown my understanding about what therapy is. Uh, and I, and I'm pretty actually uncomfortable with that word most of the time. Um, mm. Yeah. I think it all, it automatically sort of sets up a hierarchy of I know more than you do. And my gosh, like uh, youth, the youth that I work with, with have taught me so much um, about what it is that right. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and even working with, you know, families uh, in my independent practice, you know, I, I am honored, you know, when there's some friction there where they, where they, where they're teaching me something. I, I think those are really helpful responses. And, and I think mm -hmm. that, that story about the, the young fellow challenging his action therapist about their mm -hmm. relationship having this, this monetized mm -hmm. uh, reality to it. I think that's really, I, I think that's something that a lot of us are, mm -hmm. are holding and, and struggling with. And I think we just have to continue to be honest about, because um, mm -hmm. I, I think it is like in, in traditional communities, whether they're indigenous or, you know, Mennonite as, as that goes, you know, yeah. in terms of my own background, like, yeah. Um, there were there were uh, 
very significant parts of of cultural life that were kept outside of the money economy mm-hmm. very very deliberately mm-hmm. um but then people people were people who do, who did that kind of relational healing uh mm-hmm. you know played that role in the community were taken care of in other ways yeah um and and that yeah I think this is again it's one of those tensions I think we have to face and live Mm -hmm. you know we'll never we'll we'll never resolve it um but Mm -hmm. I think but I think it 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 is something that um you know we have to keep hearing those voices Mm -hmm. um that room that remind us that there is something What what's the word in in I'm I'm reaching for like incomplete or not mm-hmm. like it, it's not it, it's not a wholeness it's not a wholeness of of an mm-hmm. all my relations kind of world mm-hmm. where 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 we are uncles and aunties because we're paid to be uncles and aunties yeah um and and to to kind of I I think that's for, for me so one of the reasons that I that I got into to marriage and family therapy is I think I, I, I feel like I, I prefer to work in a way that says, um, I, I want to help people love each other mm-hmm. better. Um, and that whatever, whatever love I pour into my work, it's sort of like being a midwife, mm-hmm. you know, like I can't, the midwife can never, replace the work of the mother in birthing Mm -hmm. it 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 has to be you know it it has to be that that connection to like like ultimately what sustains human life is Mm -hmm. is love that has no money uh you know Mm -hmm. exchange in in the formula Mm -hmm. um but still there's work that can be done and and work that's you know, takes, takes a lot of skill and, and takes a lot of time and commitment that, that needs to, if you're going to do that kind of work, instead of, uh, you know, making something physical in the world to feed yourself, well, then you need, you need, you need to be taken care of in some way. But I, I think it's, it's, it's well worth keeping in front of us that, that, and I, and I think that that kind of all my relations worldview Mm -hmm. does point us and call us back to, you know, always remembering that there are ways of being with each other, with creation, um, that are not about money. And, yeah. and that's, that's really our home. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, so thanks, thanks for bringing that, mm-hmm. bringing mm-hmm. that out in the open. I've, mm-hmm. I've really enjoyed this conversation as I, as I, <laughs> enjoy all our conversations Rachel yeah. and uh and I'm really I'm really glad um that this one gets to to be shared with with other folks that will listen in and and I I hope yeah. be be stirred and fed by by things you've shared from your story I think it'll it'll yeah. connect with a lot of our listeners thank you so very much for this time oh you're welcome thanks so much Marcus